Hello, and welcome to our 2023 speaker series presented by the New Jersey chapter of the Fulbright Association. Today's speaker is artist and two-time Fulbright awardee, Siona Benjamin. Siona will be hosted by Fiona Sitkin, a member of our NJ Fulbright Board of Directors. I'm Pat Hutchinson. I'm the president of the New Jersey chapter. This speaker series was established in 2022 to encourage New Jersey Fulbright Association members to introduce themselves and share some of their many experiences and interests with the uh, fellow Fulbrighters. We also host invited speakers on timely topics, uh, folks who are, are not Fulbrighters. Uh, today's webinar describes a meeting of cultures, weaving Indian Jewish narratives from India to Israel. We're looking forward to it. The Fulbright Association is comprised of current and former recipients of Fulbright Awards and supporters of international education. The association represents over 400,000 alumni worldwide. The New Jersey chapter has over 300 active Fulbright alumni and friends, as well as thousands of people who live in New Jersey and have traveled abroad on Fulbrights. Additionally, New Jersey has hosted a great many foreign visitors who have come to study and live here. Exchanges benefit our state economically and educationally. In 2021, nearly 20,000 foreign students came to study at New, Jersey, New Jersey's colleges and universities. Their economic contributions came to over $617 million. In 2021, roughly 60 New Jerseyans received funding for foreign study and teaching. Fulbrighters represent virtually every field of interest and come from over 165 countries. What ties us together is a commitment to advancing understanding, tolerance, and peaceful relations worldwide. Please join me in welcoming Siona Benjamin, who will be um, presented by Fiona Sitkin. Hello, and I am Fiona Sitkin, and today I have the honor to host an outstanding guest, Siona Benjamin. Siona is an American immigrant artist of Bene Israel Jewish descent, born in Mumbai. Raised Jewish in a Hindu and Muslim cultures in India, and now living and working in the USA, this celebrated artist speaks to her audiences about the people's similarities, not differences, be them languages or cultures or religions or mentalities. Siona Benjamin, as Pat mentioned, is a two-time Fulbrighter and a creative free spirit. The first time she, re she researched the Jews living in India, and the second time the transcultural identity of Indian Jews who came to live in Israel. Both Fulbright projects resulted in outstanding original art, uniting people in their diversity and promoting inclusion, which is a great achievement per se. That's what free spirits do. At the end of Siona's presentation, please ask your questions using Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Do you see that? All right. Now, without further ado, I give you Siona Benjamin. To you, Siona, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fiona. I am so glad to be rhyming with your name, Siona. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, thank you for, to the Fulbright Association. Thank you to Pat Hutchinson, to Fiona Yu, to Christina at the Fulbright. And um, I am, I wanted to say, a proud Fulbrighter, uh, two times uh, Fulbrighter, and I always will be a proud Fulbrighter. I also wanted to say one thing, because in conjunction with what Pat said before, um, I have had the privilege of housing several Fulbright students over the past few years, because I have a large house and currently I have two Pakistani Fulbright students staying with me and um, Ranjita Maharaj and Huda Ahmad, both from Pakistan. I've had uh, Fulbrighters from all over the world, Russia, Brazil, you know, uh, Austria, you name it. So, um, and many other, Sri Lanka, Laos, um, have, who have had the privilege of housing. So I just wanted to mention that because it's been a very special journey besides, you know, in this way, continuing to 
show my support and help to to Fulbright Association and for all that it's done for me. So I'm going to share with you today um, some of my work, my background, my current work, um, some of my commissions, how I make a living as an artist, and then in the end I'll show you some actual examples for my two Fulbright projects. So I'm going to share screen now. Uh, okay, here goes. Okay. So um, today's topic is weaving Indian Jewish narratives from India to Israel, but um, I wanted to show, share with you some of my background, like I'm a painter first. So how did I come about uh, coming to the conclusion as to what I would do in my Fulbrights? Um, I, um, my, my subtitle is called Blue Like Me, and um, I'll tell you why in a minute, because I'm influenced a lot by, I'm a Bene Israel Jew from India. My family gradually dispersed mostly to Israel and America, but my parents remained in India. I'm now also an American living and working in New Jersey, but I still recall the ornate synagogues of my childhood, the oil lamps, the velvet and silver covered Torahs, a chair left vacant for the prophet Elijah in our Bombay synagogues. Having grown up in a predominantly Hindu Muslim society, being raised uh, Jewish and being educated in Catholic and Zoroastrian schools, I've always had to reflect upon the cultural boundary zones in which I have lived. So therefore, in my paintings, I combine the imagery of my past, like you see over here, an old synagogue from Mumbai. And here's an even older one. It's built in 15, 16, 1500s. And the tiles were imported from China. It's in Cochin, it's in South India. So mostly the Jews were in Mumbai, Cochin, and Calcutta. There's one synagogue in Delhi, but most of the synagogues lived in the, in the coastal areas. Here are some really unique pictures showing uh, the Rosh Hashanah the Magin, at the Magin Hasidim Synagogue in Mumbai. And a few examples, I have many uh, examples of, uh, of my Jewish Indian family. Uh, this is my aunt with her family, the baby on her lap, the entire family immigrated to Israel. Years later, for my second Fulbright, I had a chance to meet her children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and do and record them for my second Fulbright in Israel. So this is my aunt, my mother's sister, who and the entire family immigrated to Israel from India. Here's another example showing my mother putting henna on the hands of her sister-in-law. And people always say henna and Jewish people. Well, Middle Eastern Jews, South Asian Jews, Iranian, Iraqi, Moroccan, Ethiopian, all these Jews had more different kind of ethnic cultures and henna was one of it because being influenced by the surroundings of Muslims and Hindus around them, they had henna ceremony. Here's the hands of a Indian Jewish bride with henna on her hands, for example. Here's another unique example from my album of my great great grandfather with a long white beard, a turban, long coats like they had in the Middle Eastern culture, a star of David hanging from his pocket. Um, you know, very, they were all very proudly Jewish. There was very little anti Semitism in India because India, for one, proud, prides itself in being multicultural and having all kinds of peoples, or Austrians and Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Mughal kings coming from the north, and Greeks and Portuguese coming in later, um, and British even later. And so there was a wonderful uh, multicultural society that Jews thrived in, and then later on left because of economic reasons, but also because of the call of Zionism. Here is a unique picture also of my parents, uh, Sophie and Judah. Uh, you see the mixture of the white sari with the, the veil and wreath and the henna under her gloved hand. So the mixture of Western and Indian culture sort of in the food and the prayers and the maladies and the dress. And my mother loved Indian gold jewelry. So there she's wearing her Indian gold. So, which is very different from the kind of jewelry we get here. So this mixture was very unique and different growing up. So all of this came together uh, fairly recently after my two Fulbrights in a book that I did with Professor Ori Soltis at Georgetown University called Growing Up Jewish in India, Synagogues, Customs and Communities from the Bene Israel to the Art of Siona Benjamin. 
So we had various contributors talk about the different communities in India. I wrote a chapter about what it was growing up Jewish in India. And Ori wrote a chapter about how this all influences my art. It's available on Amazon. Um, and it is a fairly recent new book that has just come out. So I uh, combine the imagery of my past. So I'm influenced a lot by Indian Persian miniature paintings, like you can see here. This is a Hindu miniature painting, for example. And also I'm influenced by Sephardic, Jewish illuminated, Islamic illuminated manuscripts, like this example over here. Um, Therefore, in um, my paintings, I combine this imagery that I play, um, combining my past to the, play, to the role I play in America today. Um, and recently, my work has started to take a turn where the quest to find a particular home has mostly diminished. The spiritual borderland seems more and more, more and more important, and the need to rebel against all groups that want to categorize compartmentalize and are nationalistic in nature seem to have taken voice in my work. So I won't go into details of every one of these paintings, but I will go to in some of them. I am therefore a transcultural artist. I believe that transculturalism will help an artistic in other ways to be a bridge between the traditional and the modern. A transcultural person is rather like a chameleon, being able to change his or her colors according to the situation and environment. Today's world politics pushes and promotes a need for a sense of belonging, a categorization of sorts, either black or white. The gray scale in between needs to be explored so that when, when one makes final evaluations, it is painted with a fairness and allows us to learn about all perspectives and points of view. So I'm also influenced, I can say, by my second MFA. My first MFA is in painting and art history, but my second MFA is in theater set design. Uh, set design, I did some of it um, for some years because I thought I was changing my profession and becoming a set designer, but then getting married and having children stopped me from traveling so much in the initial years. And this set design, uh, the making of the renderings, the models, the final sets, uh, I've done Rigoletto, the rendering for that, and the final set on stage actually influenced me very much later in making installations in my work and uh, creating installations of my art in the spaces where I exhibit. Um, here are a few early examples of my work. So here is um, a traditional Mughal miniature painting where a woman is sitting idyllically in the, in the lawn of her palace, smoking a hookah. In my painting, Finding home number 28, a figure myself in blue jeans is seated in a traditional miniature landscape is sipping Coke through a long straw, imbibing the intoxicating American elixir poison Coca-Cola, symbolizing the, the lure of the West, which draws me to reside in the US. In the background, the house says Mother Ima in Hebrew, and the once lush foliage and blooming lotuses in the pond are now wilted and filled with trash and pollution. There is a demon on top of the painting with a gun and a nuclear weapon suggesting that war will infiltrate and further disrupt the scene. A couple other examples from my older work that will give you a lead on to my newer work and my Fulbright work is this painting called Zaham, which is inspired from the Quran, but also from Jewish illuminated manuscripts. Are the swords a weapon that will descend on her or are they a protection against unforeseen dangers. What seems like Urdu or Arabic writing above actually spells out it's unfortunate in English. So people say like, what's unfortunate? I say, well, I was reading the newspaper maybe that day and I said, oh, so unfortunate this happened. And so I came in my studio and I wrote it. It looks like Arabic writing, but it's actually just plain simple English. So I like to change and make part of that as, as part of my design. Here's the lower part of the painting, the Shema prayer, which is the central prayer taught to me as a child. My sari becomes the nourishment for the, for the flowers. That, and there's many other, much more symbolism there, but I'll move on because I have wanted to share a lot more with you. Here is a Mughal miniature painting of a king holding a globe with his hand on his sword. Um, and that is an inspiration for this painting which is called Sister, is done in response to the Middle East crises. 
half Jewish and half Muslim, both her hands display the rich henna of their similarities. They seem peaceful, yet in front of them, there is a blasting plunger and wires that indicate a bomb connected to them. Will they destroy themselves or is there, or is there any hope that they will be saved from themselves? So my work is also a lot about social political commentary. And so in this case, most of my family having immigrated to Israel and the India-Pakistan conflict, which com continues to go on like the Middle East crisis, I, have, I make sometimes paintings that points out certain issues that talk about sociopolitical conflict like that. Another example is my series, which is called Farishte, Angels in Urdu. I explore the women of the Torah and bring them forward to combat wars and violence of today in a midrash, which means interpretation of intricate paintings. In this one, which is titled Vashti, who was the, the queen of the king Ahasuerus from the story of Queen Esther, which has been made into many scrolls over the, over the centuries. And I've made one also, I'll show you later uh, as a special commission. So Vashti in this case was cast out. Now she looks in a black and white setting from yesteryear, postcards from another target, a chessboard of genocide, the near Tamid or eternal flame from a lost synagogue, a palace of another dictator, smokestacks from your ancestors crematorium. I searched during my journey, but cannot find. How can they erase without a trace, I wonder? Now more than necessary, along with her dignity, will she restore yours? So like Alice in Wonderland, Vashti comes back and looks into the setting of an overthrown chair of a dictator, the chessboard of genocide. And she asks you, what has changed? What is the newspaper of today telling you in this picture of the house that she's looking through, like Alice in Wonderland? And then here's a couple of the examples of my pop series, which is titled Finding Number 74, Lilith. So I'm very interested in the mythology of, I like to recycle mythology. I like to, I read, I read the book by Joseph Campbell called The Power of Myth. And that really interested me as to how recycling of mythology can make new mythology and therefore new art. So based on the Jewish Midrashic, Midrashic legends, the character Lilith is the first Eve who was created the same time as Adam. She was unwilling to forego her equality with Adam. She took her case to God who responded to her seductive powers by revealing his divine name. She earned her ticket out of paradise and into eternal exile. Lilith made a return in feminist history as an example of female strength and mystery. So here is a detail of the painting where she says, a thousand years have I waited. So she becomes any woman who's been wronged in war or violence or she can be Ukrainian, she can be Pakistani, she can be Palestinian, she can be Israeli, she can be anybody. And she asks for revenge or justice or whatever um, the situation calls for. Here is an example of, uh, of what I'm influenced by. Roy Lichtenstein is a um, famous um, pop artist from America combined with the drama of Indian Amar Chitra Katha comics uh, that I grew up with along with Disney and other comic books that came from the West in India. Indian comic books were wonderful because they, even though I was raised Jewish, I was introduced to Indian mythology through these comic books, even though I couldn't actually practice it because I was not Hindu. And of course, Bollywood. I grew up in the middle of Bollywood in Mumbai. My mother ran a school and a lot of the Bollywood kids would come to her school. And so this pop culture was very, very influential for me. Um, so therefore you can say that all of this creeps into my paintings and the blonde heroine in Lichtenstein's paintings has been recast as a blue maiden. Very often I look at my skin and it has turned blue. It tends to do that when I face certain situations of people who are stereotyping and categorizing other people who, unlike, who are unlike themselves. I therefore over the years developed many blue skin characters. This blue self portrait takes on many roles and forms through which I can theatrically explore ancient and contemporary dilemmas. I'm also inspired by Indian goddesses, Kali, Krishna. I show how these characters use their blue skin to mostly tell or retell stories. In this process of recycling, it merely reminds me in making the work and hopefully my audience in viewing the work that myth making is cyclical and timeless. Thus the blue skin has become for me a symbol of being a Jewish woman of color. 
this is leading you on to the Fulbrights that I did because that was the basis of what I, I thought about what I would do as, for my Fulbrights when I wrote the Fulbrights. My work is mostly about the blue skin, about being the other, about being different, about being categorized as and not categorized and how not to categorize. I also went back to, into using over the years um, Indian and American dancers to who I painted blue and they popped out of my paintings and they did, you know, um, theatrical um, performances in front of my work in galleries and museums. So all of this has influenced what you will see coming up as how I formulated what I decided to do for my two Fulbrights. But also I can say that I want to contribute and say that making a living as an artist, how do I do that? Um, I do that full-time as an artist. And again, my Indian miniature painting background or my ethnic culture has come in use when I do large installations or commissions for hotels like this. I've done seven, six foot artworks for every floor of this particular hotel. I've also uh, done synagogue commissions where I've done a Torah curtain and table cover for the synagogue in Pennsylvania. And also the Indian Persian miniature and the illuminated manuscript background helped me do this commission for, which is a 16 foot floor for a synagogue in St. Louis. Um, again, the Indian Persian miniature painting uh, came into use where I used uh, that technique to do a commission for a New York gallery where I uh, did a 15 foot long scroll about the story of Esther. And um, in this case, he actually asked me to paint Esther Blue, the main character in the story because she was hiding who she was. She was hiding her identity in the story. And she was also categorized as the other. So very often the blueness comes forth in also some of my commissions, like this scroll, for example, which was commissioned by me by a gallery in Manhattan, by an Eastern European gallery in, on Fifth Avenue. And then private commissions for private homes. This is a commission for a Coca-Cola CEO, where he also asked me, he wanted me to paint Esther, I'm sorry, uh, Rachel and Rebecca meeting by the well, and he wanted them painted blue also. So my um, characters can were played also in these kind of private commissions where the elephant is blue over here for a private home in Florida. And then I've done some furniture where the Torah arc, uh, which I did for a school in the Bronx, um, which I painted and gold leafed in 22 karat gold leaf. I've done other commercial projects where the blueness comes forth in the swimming pool. I've also done some children's books like uh, this one, which is uh, called I Am Hava, which I did last year. And currently I am designing two, illustrating two children's books based on some Indian Jewish mythology for two major publishers in, in the United States. I've also done recently, most recently, a commission where I did um, 19 Torah covers for a synagogue, uh, which again, um, the style of painting, the mythology came forth and was used by the synagogue. I also believe that I want my art to be uh, accessible to not only wealthy clients, but also to people who can afford merchandise. So I'm making uh, silk shawls and yoga mats and pouches and prints and other things which you can see on my Blue Like Me website so that you can, my clients can also have access to having my art in different forms and mediums. And then finally, I'm going to take you to uh, my first Fulbright, which I got in 2011, which was called Faces Weaving Indian Jewish Narratives. Um, I thought about what I would do for when I applied for the Fulbright. And I thought I wanted to continue somehow my story of being Indian Jewish. And so I thought I would go to India and I would interview some of the 4,000 Jews left it. There were about 30,000 Jews in India when I was growing up. Now there are about 4,000 or less. There are about, you know, I don't know, a handful of Jews left in Calcutta, like maybe, I don't know, five or six Jews left in Cochin. 
there are still about close to 4,000 compared to the large numbers that were there, still a micro minority in India. And so I thought I would go to India and I would interview these people. I would videotape them and I would ask them what the questions would be. What is your role as an Indian? What is your role as a Jew? How do you see yourself as an Indian and a Jew? And I would take photographs, but I'm not a photographer. So I'm a painter. So I thought, but I still wanted to take photographs. And so I took photographs like, like so. I positioned them in very uh, different kinds of ways in doorways of synagogues and families, which were very unique. And they told me their stories. And then I, when I came back, I got additional grants and I did photo collage paintings. So I cut out the photographs that I had taken. I placed them within the stories of what they had told me about what they thought about what their role was as an Indian and, 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 and Jewish person still living in India. And especially this uh, older woman had told me that she, she, um, she values and she respects all the religions that she is surrounded by but they are outside the wall of her, of her garden, so to speak. Inside her garden is her Eliyahu Hanavi um, and you know, all that she is uniquely Jewish about. And outside the wall is what she respects, but she doesn't you know, really allow because we are not you know, idol worshipers and we are monotheistic religion. So she's very clear on that. And that was, I found really interesting about this story. This is my mother, uh, who still continued to live in India, did not immigrate to Israel like the rest of her family. So I did a triptych about her, my daughter and myself and how through her hair and the, she has woven and told me these different stories and taught me and my daughter about the ancestral stories. And therefore that has led me to do the book now, Growing Up Jewish in India, but also to keep these stories alive through my, through, through my two Fulbrights. So I think she was the key person who taught me to be proud about my Indianness and my Jewishness. And I think I pay tribute to her through this triptych of me, her, and my daughter. And then these unique portraits I took of Indian Jews were so amazing. This um, uh, older man's face was just so beautiful and so it could be like on a coin. So I cut him out like in Photoshop I placed him on the background of the synagogue in Pune. Uh, there were two synagogues. There are two synagogues in Pune where he would come every day to pray. And I even recorded him praying when he came and interviewed him about his, you know, the questions that I asked him. And then I had uh, several, I still continue to have several student interns from different um, universities. In this case, this intern is learning how to gold leaf. And this is the final photo collage painting that I did of this particular man, his story and um, his dedication to coming to the synagogue almost every day. He passed away the following year. So I was happy to have recorded him in time and his stories. Here's another example from the India Fulbright where I interviewed an Indian Jewish bride. I happened to be able to go to uh, record her, her henna ceremony which is the day before the actual uh, wedding and see the unique culture of Indian Jews and how they celebrated several days and how they were influenced by Muslim and Indian and Buddhist and all the different kinds of communities around them. And so I did a photo collage like this on the computer. And then I did a photo collage painting, which included um, parts of her wedding, her husband's black and white talit over her head, uh, what she liked. And later on, a year or two, a year and a half later, by the time I finished this project, after coming back from my first full ride, she was already pregnant with her first child. So I was just finishing that painting at the same time. And there she is with, you know, in this form of Indian painting, which is called a warli, with her little cradle in the, in the house with the menorah on the top. So these are a few examples of my Indian Jewish uh, Fulbright. You can see all 45 of them on my website, which is artsiona.com. And you can see that under the Fulbright section. Um, I'll move on to now sharing with you the second Fulbright, which I got in 2016-17 from Motherland to Fatherland, Transcultural Indian Jews in Israel. 
So when I wrote the second Fulbright, I didn't, wasn't sure I would get it, but I was so happy to have gotten it. And I said, what is the part two of what the Indian Jewish Fulbright was about? What happened to the people? Where did they go? Did they retain their culture? Did they um, flourish as Indian Jews in Israel? Some of them have even immigrated to America. My mother's mother immigrated to Cleveland, Ohio. My father's mother immigrated to Beersheba, Israel. Some of the family immigrated to Canada, but most of my family have immigrated to Israel. So I got a chance to go to the Indian Jewish synagogues there. And I interviewed people there just like I did for my first Fulbright. But I said, I don't want to do the same project, the photo collage paintings, because it would be, I don't know, boring. So I decided I would do something different. And I would take photographs of different generations. Like for example, this Cuccini grandmother with her part Beni Israel, part Cuccini and part Ashkenazi granddaughter. And I photographed them with a black background. I just took a black fabric and everywhere I went, I hung it over doors and windows and found the right light and natural light. I photographed these people. And um, so I did many different generation layered like this. And I'll tell you in a minute what I'm gonna do with that or I, I've been doing with it. Here's my cousin Romy with her, who's a Ben Israel Jew, who with his son, who's half Ben Israel and half Cochini uh, Jew. And he's the working as a big um, you know, uh, guy in the IDF in Israel. And his stories of you know, uh, fighting for Israel and my, my cousin's stories of how he and his Cochini wife have retained their Indian Jewishness in many different ways for their children and their 22 grandchildren um, that are all now live in Israel. And then these two sisters out of the five sisters of my other cousin who married a Yemenite Jew. So here was an Indian Jew married to a Yemenite Jew and he had five daughters and how have they maintained their Yemeniteness, their Indian Jewishness, what, and one of their daughters, the eldest daughter is Mayan actually spent five or six years or maybe more in India learning yoga. And so she brought back some of that Indianness and, and I held on to that in that way um, by traveling to India and living there for several years. And how they maintain that in their ritual during their festivals in their home. Here's another example, Ilana Shazor um, married a Romanian Jew and her daughter, Zohar, um, you know, who both live in Haifa, and Tel Aviv, Israel, and how the, the daughter has, you know, again, maintained both sides of some more and some less. Uh, I found out like how they have integrated or um, mixed up with the more Israeli culture and some have actually maintained their uniqueness. Here's a mother and daughter uh, from Neva team, which is a Cochini community, which is outside of Beersheba. And both of them were Cochini Jews. Um, the father is also Cochini, and how they have actually maintained their Cochini Jewishness, which is different from Ben Israel and Baghdadi and some of the other sects of Indian Jews. And how this community has an actual community in called Nevatim near, and they have this whole Moshav where they live and they really maintain their Cochini Jewishness. And now they are, um, the Indian Jewish community is planning to build a Indian Jewish museum in Nevatim because they have all that land and they also, also have a synagogue which is very similar to the Cochini synagogue that you, that you saw earlier in my presentation and they have actually recreated the synagogue there and now they plan to have a museum there and they are raising money to do that. Here's another example uh, of uh, um, an Indian Jewish father, a Bene Israel father with his Bene Israel son. And um, again, them telling me the stories of what the migration brought to them and their family, how they integrated, didn't integrate, what problems they had, what questions they had, what concerns they had. And so it was, I have interviewed in this case about 50 people or so. And in the first Fulbright, I interviewed about 70 people. Um, and I have, um, recordings of all of them. And now what was I going to do with all of this? So I'm making lenticular prints, which is 
um, 3D photographs where I will combine, there's a way to layer the photographs um, on Photoshop and send it to a lenticular printmaker where the you look from one side and you will see the father's face and you look on the other side of the same picture and you will see the son's face or the daughter's face. And so these are very, it's a very unique technique where you will see the two or three generations layered as to one picture. And I'm still writing grants to complete this project because the other first one, I did find the money and I finished the project. The second one, I'm still writing because they are very expensive to make the lenticular prints. And so I'm slowly making them as we, as I speak and uh, hoping to find um, more money to finish this project sometime soon in between all the other commission work that I do. My two uh, websites are artsiona.com and my merchandise website is um, bluelikeme.com. And um, I would love to take um, uh, questions from the audience or from the participants or from Fiona. And uh, thank you very much to Fulbright for inviting me. I will stop share and we can go to questions. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Siona. I am more than impressed. You know, I am. You exceeded all my expectations. I expected a lot. You exceeded all my expectations with your in-depth insights into migration and how it influences the people and the art and how it reflects in your art. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. My first question is, and then, you know, I, I am privileged, I can ask the first question, right? And then we take the question of other people, if any. Um, I am interested in how did your family influence you in becoming an artist? The family is spread all over the world. Still, you know, you are kind of tight knit in a way. And how did they influence your choice of your way of life or of your occupation and things of that nature, please? Well, um, the family, unfortunately, when I was growing up, my cousins that I was growing up with, they decided to migrate, immigrate to Israel. And I was kind of sad. I felt like a little bit abandoned because I really love my cousins and I still continue to love them. And and I felt, I was just telling my cousin recently, Moshe in Israel, I was like, oh, why didn't my family, my parents immigrate too, to be nearer you guys? And he made a very good point. He said, if you hadn't immigrated to America, your art would not have flourished as much and okay. would not have as if you had lived in India or come even to Israel because, you know, America has different opportunities that is, I'm very thankful for being, being living here for the last 35 years now. Uh, the most important person that influenced my, my life uh, to choose was my mother and my father, but my mother. My mother learned some Indian dance and she wanted to go also to art school. But at that time, it was like how gra my grandfather said, oh, you're going to be more practical. And she studied science a little bit. And then she ended up being a school principal. And so when she found that I was left-handed and I was artistic and I all I did when I was little was draw 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 and paint and the best gift I could get was a paint box or marker pens or something like that I mean I just automatically so in high school she encouraged me to take the special examinations and then I went to after high school I went to special art school which was very wonderful art school called the JJ School of Art in Mumbai it was hard to get into but I managed to get in and uh, I was there to do my undergraduate years in both painting, art history, and in metal craft, where I studied enameling also. And then I met a professor who was on a Fulbright, actually, to Mumbai. And he got me the full scholarship to come to the US to study uh, painting and art history in the US. And then I did my second MFA in, in theater set design. But I can say that my mother was very amazing in just allowing me to my father would sometimes ask me, are you sure it's such an unsure profession? I mean, you know, being an artist, how do you make a living? He was like, but he was very gentle about it. But my mother was very dedicated to always encouraging me and helping me 
do what I wanted to do. And, but my father did say too, you know, I don't have a son, but you're my son and my daughter. So, you know, he kind of always gave me that strength to kind of, I was lucky to have very wonderful, encouraging parents, I can say. So, but most of the family had left and gone to Israel and uh, they encouraged me now. They like everything I put up on Facebook and, you know, they are there for my exhibitions wherever they can come to. But um, we are so spread out in such a diaspora. So it's difficult to see them often. It's, yeah, it's tough for the family to be spread out, huh? Yeah, it mm. is. It is. Yeah. Now, um, so you came to the U.S. as an artist already, right? Yes, I, I had already done my undergraduate in art in India. And I came, I, like I said, the professor who was on a Fulbright to India recruited me and got me my full scholarship to come to the U.S. So this, ah. you know, yeah, it was through this Fulbright professor that uh, I met. Uh -huh. in yeah. So Fulbright, you know, is um, influencing you all around. Yes. You know, from absolutely. start to now and, and things yes. of that nature. Okay. Now, there is a question on chat. Um, Pat Hutchinson asks you, I love your figures and the patterns that surround them. Can you talk to us about what the color blue signifies to you? You repeated it many times. What's, what does it signify? Oh, like I said in my lecture, um, the, the, the blue color is the, the, the skin color has become a symbol for me of being a Jewish woman of color, of being the other, of being different, of being asked repeatedly, Jews in India, how's that possible? So I slowly kind of turned blue because, and why blue? Because it's the color of the sky and the ocean and it gave me the permission, so to speak, to belong everywhere and nowhere. To, uh -huh because I felt like I belonged everywhere because my family is dispersed so much and nowhere because I feel sometimes a little bit homeless. So that's why I did my first series of works, which is called Finding Home. Where is home? Is Israel home? Is America home? Is India home? You know, I can fit into so many categories and I fit into none of the categories. And sometimes uh -huh. that feeling is, is gives me a feeling of like um, finding, really desperately finding what is home. Uh -huh. but at the same time, being liberated that there is no home and it's okay. You know, mm. I'll, find, I'll pitch my tent where I go. And so the blue colored skin is inspired by some, you know, mythological references coming from a country like India, but also influencing me in a way and creating my own blueness, my uh -huh. own skin color of being turquoise, of being blue, of being the color of the sky. And, the, and also the talit and the tzitzit and, there's blue pottery all over the world. So that blueness is so universal that I can therefore belong everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Ah, really? That's very new to me. Thank you for explaining it. And thank you for asking this question, Pat. Yeah, there is another question for you. Did you ever consider teaching at the college? And I side with this question. You explain everything so very much as a professional teacher that this is also a question from me. Did you ever consider teaching yes. at a college or university? Yes, um, initially yeah, I did do some teaching. I did, I was a adjunct and then I was a um, you know, honors professor for a couple of, and then I, I taught here at Drew for a couple of semester, Trinity College in Connecticut, just a little bit, not too much, but, I taught like a couple of semesters, a year here and there, and I enjoyed it. And I really found very, and I still continue to teach in different ways because many universities, Baruch College, um, William yeah. Hudson, Montclair State University, send me interns. I have four interns this semester. Ah. One in marketing, one in uh, animation, one in um, you know uh, sculpture. So I get interns that I kind of teach one-on-one, -on -one, which is very interesting to me. But I chose not to teach because I wanted to make art. Ah. I mean, I, I, I don't say I don't I don't say that people who teach can't make art, but I took a challenge on myself that I wanted to make a living making art. So ah. I wanted to do commissions and sell my paintings. And it's a little challenging because I don't get a salary every month, but 
that puts me on the edge and you know it's uh, and to be able to try to do that and so i did teach but i didn't choose to continue because i felt like i really want to have the freedom to paint and teaching was wonderful but it took a lot of my energy uh-huh decided to not do it full time yeah, because you, it's not only energy. As a professional educator, I tell you that firsthand, you need to prepare. You need to give yes. your time to thinking and planning and yes. writing the plan and uh, thinking how to. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I do the planning and the writing and the plan, everything, but I do it for my commissions now. Um, I'm doing like, you know, two children's books right now. That is so much of sketching and planning and research you can see behind on my board. So I prefer to do that kind of planning and not teaching planning. And I made that decision earlier on. I did some teaching and I really enjoyed it. But the students are kind of coming to me anyway, like between the, I mean, the Fulbright scholars, students that come and live with me, you know, since I have this large house and I house them and and the interns that come every semester almost and intern with me, anything from two to four semester students I get. And I work with them one-on-one -on -one to do certain projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are so multifaceted and so diverse as a professional that I am not surprised by the next question. Do you play music? No, <laughs> I don't sing, I don't play music. No, I mean, I, I took some piano lessons when I was younger from some nuns in my school, in the convent school, uh, no. <laughs> ah, and do you dance? I did also study some dance when I was younger as a child. My uh -huh. mother was very encouraging. She wanted me to try this and that. And so she put me uh -huh. in the school and, you know, like she was um, very encouraging of everything, but I stuck with my art in the, uh -huh. the art school. So I did. And the dance actually influences me, whatever little I learned, uh -huh. not music that much, but dance, it kind of influences the lyrical line in my work. Um, I work with dancers, you know, and I coordinate with them and I plan with them and they do wonderful performances with me. So you can see the theater and the dance sort of influences me also. Yeah, yeah, well, um... I don't know if we have more questions. Hello? Hello, questions? Well, I have no more questions. I am very, very grateful to you for coming here and doing what you did and you did it wonderfully and um, inspiring all of us. Thank you ever so much. And uh, <laughs> I am looking forward to coming to your exhibitions. Oh, I well, you all are invited and Fulbright is invited. Always thank you, Fulbright, for all the opportunities that you've given me. And it's wonderful to get to know the New Jersey chapter and everybody over here. Thanks to Ranjita, actually, uh, my student who encouraged me. She's like, you're not part of the New Jersey chapter? I'm like, oh, I should be, shouldn't I? And then she introduced me to you all. So my students who are living with me have been also little uh -huh. bright angels. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you ever so much um, from all of the Fulbright New Jersey board members and all of the Fulbright New Jersey members. And uh, so long. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.